So the Monroeville Arts Council um, has many, many different programs. Art in the Park is one of them. Um, and the Monroeville Library also has many different classes that you can um, join in on. This one right now is just watercolor. So we're gonna get started. And this watercolor picture that we're doing tonight, last, um, last month we did a watercolor painting and this month we're doing a floral, okay? Next month, it'll be something else. We're gonna to try to do a different thing every month so that um, you, know, you kind of get a feel for everything. Last month, we did fruit. So this month, we're gonna do floral. And the, the purpose of this month's picture is to show the fragility of petals of a flower, how fragile they are, how transparent they are. Because a lot of flowers, like a rose, they're opaque. You don't see through them, but there are some flowers that they're so fragile. You can almost see your hand through them. They're so, they're like tissue paper. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna start with the leaves. And if you can't see what I'm doing right here on the paper, you can watch the screen of, the, um, of my laptop. So you'll be able to see exactly what we're doing. Or you can do this one. Yep, this is the actual picture that we're gonna do so that we can do those nice tissue paper leaves. That, that is a, um, no, it's not a hibiscus. It's a, oh, now you're gonna, no. Oh, no, I'll think of it now. It begins with an H. I have them planted with my tomatoes. They grow well among my tomatoes. But we're gonna start with the leaves. You're gonna use whatever kind of greens that you want for your leaves. And we're gonna use a little bit of salt. And the salting is what causes some texturing on the actual leaves because there is a um, chemical uh, reaction with the paint. Okay, so that's what's gonna cause the um, texturing on the leaf, okay? What I've done ahead of time is I have used a masking agent and you can see that masking agent here in yellow. It's only yellow so that you can see it better, okay? And it's almost like a rubber cement. When you put it on, you paint it on just like you would anything else, but you never use a good paintbrush because it'll ruin your paintbrushes. So I actually get the little throwaway eyebrow brushes so that I can use that and then throw them away. And that masking agent, where you put it on, it's going to keep the paper white so that you can paint over it and not have to try to paint around all those little white veins. So we're gonna go with our greens first. And for your leaves, you can use any kinds of a green. There's sap green, there's earth green. You can mix your own green by using some blues and yellows. It's up to you. My favorite green is called sap green. And it's a nice earthy green. So I'm gonna just start painting in some of my leaves. Some of them I will use salt on, some of them I won't. Some I will put extra layers on later because the thing with watercolor is it's nice and transparent. And being nice and transparent, you will see all of the extra layers of paint that you put on. So that's what helps to show um, some texturing, some layering, on your actual painting themselves. You can paint all over your picture. You don't have to go from top to bottom. You don't have to do um, the background first. It's entirely up to you. It's what your preference is. However, you have to be careful with watercolor because it's watery, it will dry quickly. So unless you want additional layers over your dried paint, you have to work your paint nice and wet so that you can get your whole area done before areas start to dry. 
because if you go over those dried areas a second time, you're gonna get a second layer of paint. And then you'll see those brush strokes. That's probably one of the biggest complaints with watercolor is people will say, well, I see lines through it. How do I avoid that? Those lines are just double, triple, quadruple layers of paint because it's already started to dry. So the key with watercolor is to use water, a lot of it, to keep your surface nice and wet until you want it to dry. It will certainly dry, but you don't want it to dry before you want it to. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna just do a couple more leaves and then I'm gonna move on to at least one of our flowers so that we don't run out of time before we get the main event done. The main event to me is going to be these nice, beautiful flowers. What heaviness of paper do you use? I use 140 pound. I use Arches watercolor paper and I use cold press. There's two different types. There's cold press and hot press. Hot press has the tendency to not be quite as porous as the cold press. So because of that, it shows every stroke that you do. I like the cold press because it's more porous. It allows for your paint to be um, sucked down into the paper because watercolor paper is actually um, dried rag, pressed rag. So it's very absorbent, which is good, but you have to be careful as to what you put on because you're not going to be able to take it back off. So you have to be careful with, um, you know, the coloring that you use. Are you also able to move it up a little bit, the paper for the screen, maybe? Just sure. Like, How about this way? Yeah. There that's we good. go. Yeah, there we good. go. I'm I'm talking and I'm talking and and moving away from where I need to be. The screen more. Well, I actually can, but I wasn't paying attention to it because oh, I have it up here. here. <laughs> I've got it everywhere. So I'm putting my paint on and you can see that I'm still nice and wet over here. You're not able to see my stroke lines and I'm going to throw a little bit of salt on there so that you can see what these salt reactions will do. You can see them already. It's much darker. Yep. So we can actually stand up. You can. Oh, sure. Sure. So the other thing too there. is when you are wanting to put other colors in, if you want other colors to blend into what you've already done, so I'll put a little bit of sienna brown to make my leaf look like it might be browning along the edge. But you want to do that when your paint is wet. You don't want to do that when it's already started to dry or what's going to happen is you're just going to have a brown line and it's not going to look realistic. So if you want it to be realistic, you want to put it in while it's wet. We'll put a couple little bug spots too where a bug might be eating it. Okay. So you can wet it, like if it starts to dry and you just realize you want to add something, can you like put a paintbrush and just clear water in? No, no, wish you could. But the reason that you can't do that is because when you're using watercolor, the water and the paint combined is a special ratio. It might be 50% paint, 50% water. It might be 30% water, 70% paint. It just depends on what you've mixed. Now you're not gonna do this chemical thing in your head every time you mix paint. So you can't just add water because then you've changed that ratio. And if you change that ratio, that water will push the paint that's already down here away and you'll get like a bloom. You'll get like a water spot. So when you know that you're doing a bigger area of something, then you wanna make sure you've mixed enough so that you can keep using what you've already mixed instead of going back and trying to remix. Now, if you've 
done it a long time, then you can probably get pretty close to that ratio without, you know, being too concerned about it. But if you're new to watercolor, it will cause um, a big water spot on your paper and then, then you'll be unhappy and then you won't want to watercolor anymore. So. Can you fix, any, fix the mistake? You can. What you have to do is be patient and that's lacking in 99.9% .9 of society. <laughs> so you have to be patient. You have to allow it to totally dry and then you can put another wash over the whole thing and it'll lessen what you see as a, a mistake. Yeah, but you have to be patient and allow it to dry. And because it's rag, you have to really allow it to dry. When you touch it and it feels dry, it may not be because inside that paper, because it's pressed rag, it might still be wet. So you have to definitely be patient. So I'm gonna dry my one leaf here, just so you can see, first of all, the reaction to the salt. And secondly, so that we can start the flower. You never wanna paint up against wet paint because then they'll bleed together, okay? So we're gonna dry this real quick. Okay, and you should be able to see now, I'll show you up here first, but then I'm going to show you close up too. You can see what the salt does. It doesn't yeah. look, it looks like, um, it probably looks like, it's like a, it's a little salt granule picks up the, the paint. And so when you brush it off, it takes the paint with it. Yeah, that's a neat picture. Anyway. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Looks like it could also work really well with landscape. It works great with landscaping. It works great, like if you're doing wood grain. It works great if you're doing grass. It'll even work good if you're doing, if you want texturing in some clothing to make it almost look like a weave. It just depends. You have to decide what you want to use it in. What you would never want to use it in is like skin um, or something that you want to be really nice and smooth, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna to go to our pink flower. Our pink flower is a very muted pink. So that means it's a very washed out pink. So that means we're gonna use water first. And anytime you want something to be really washed out and pale, you first have to use clean water. So you wanna make sure that you're using clean water and you wanna make sure that the paint that you put on has a lot of water added to it, okay? So I am going to wet my flower with plain water. And the reason I'm wetting it is because by wetting it with water, I am giving my paint that I'm gonna put on a path because the paint that I'm putting on is wet. And so it's gonna follow that wet path and the wet path is water. So I am giving it a nice wet path here. And then I'm going to mix a nice pink. Now, of course you could use any color, but I'm using pink. And I'm using a color called alizarin crimson. It's a real pretty, pretty light pink. And I'm adding a lot of water to it because I don't want it to be too dark. 
I'm going to add a little tiny bit of red to that just to change the color slightly. And I'm going to paint my flower with that pink. I'm not going to paint every single spot. I'm going to allow some of my petal to just remain white. But I'm going to put that color down. And by allowing some of it to remain white, I'm helping to show the tissue paper thickness of this flower. It's so light in color and so thin that you just don't see the color everywhere. Now towards the center, I want my center to really stand out. So in order for that to happen, what do I have to do, Glenn? You have to not water it out. Correct. I need to make it really vibrant in color. So I'm putting a lot more pigment in. And I'm going to deepen that pigment with a little bit of purple. Amazing. You don't even have that much paint on your. No, your watercolor, paint, so. watercolor paint is so intense mm -hmm. that you only need like little drops of it. You don't really need a whole lot of it. Okay, so I'm going to get nice and deep towards the center. And because I'm nice and wet, it's going to follow that path of the water. Isn't it cool? I have painted this with different ones before. A little bit of watercolor, some oil, and acrylic. You don't paint it often, but I do like to paint on corners and stuff. Yeah. I do like experimenting with more. Mm -hmm. So I got you into it a couple years ago. <laughs> I don't think you'd have to convince him to do. I don't think you'd have to make him do anything. I think he's he likes art. He's born with a paintbrush in his hand, I think. OK, so now I have my nice center, really intense in color there. I will go back in later and put some shadowing in because everything needs a shadow, no matter what you are doing, if it's a person, if it's a landscape, if it's a piece of fruit, in order for it to um, show its dimension and its roundness or whatever, you have to have shadows. So even though you don't want to, because I know a lot of people are like, I don't want to ruin it, you're not going to ruin it. You're only going to enhance it with shadows. But we're going to let this settle in we're going to let this um, soak down into the paper. And while that's happening, I'm going to go back and do a couple more leaves. But now on this leaf, I'm going to change up my color a little bit so that not every one of my leaves is exactly the same. And I'm going to add a little bit of light blue to this green to just change the color slightly. And I'm going to go over here because I don't want to go anywhere near that. And I'm going to do a leaf over here with that. So it doesn't change it drastically, but it changes it up enough so that not all of my greens are going to dry exactly the same. So would the reason for that be that the sun hits them differently or some of them are in shadow or shade? Um, some are, some could be newer leaves, some are older leaves. So sometimes the older leaves are more intense in color because the, the newer leaves seem to be fresher. Um, so that's, the, you know, that's why. And plus, like anything else, you don't want every single thing on your paper to be the same color. So we're just going to change this up a little bit. And again, you don't have to do greens like with just blues or you can do greens and some browns and there's two different kinds of browns there's a sienna which is a lighter brown then there's the umber which is the darker brown you could do greens with black and make it a more deep 
green. You could do greens with yellow and make it a yellow green. Anytime you're changing up colors though, the one thing that you do want to remember is you don't want a flower with 15 different colors of green on your one paper with your flower. If you have one flower and it's one type of flower, it might have two or three types of green, but it's not gonna have 15. So you don't wanna change it for every leaf that you do. You wanna minimize your color slightly, but only because you wanna minimize it to the point where it's looking realistic. I'm a realistic painter. So if I was doing an abstract, it probably wouldn't matter. But because I am doing more realism, then you want that to, you know, you wanna keep within those boundaries a little bit. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna do one more leaf and then we're gonna dry this flower up and I'm gonna put in some shadows so that we can get one flower all finished so that you can see what it's gonna look like all finished. And then we will move on. How's that? Do you ever watercolor paint without sketching out what you're gonna do? Because, you know, it's fun, I think, to paint without like it's, having the drawing, but I think with watercolor, it's really hard because well, you don't know what you're gonna paint yet. Watercolor is gonna go where you show it the path. And if you can think far enough ahead to know where you want to go with your water, then you don't have to sketch like that. I always sketch, even if it's something um, now, you know, if I'm doing a, a lake, I'm obviously not going to sketch in the water. I'm going to sketch in a horizon line or something. But if if it's something that um, is detailed, like even the flower. I always would sketch at least the perimeter of the flower so I know where I want my water to go or whatever. Plus, I'm more of a realistic painter. So if I was doing something where I wouldn't care if, you know, if it went out of bounds, then it wouldn't be as important. But I like, I like to know exactly where my, where my lines are. <laughs> so I'm going to dry this and then we're going to shadow this so that you can see how we're going to finish one whole flower. Whoops. <laughs> it does. That's the center of the flower. So just some more things about your watercolor. If you use Miskit, like I have, you never want to leave your Miskit on for more than about two weeks. So if you don't want to finish your painting right away, that's fine. But you don't want to leave your Miskit on too long because then it really kind of attaches to the paper and it doesn't want to come off easily. The Miskit keeps it white so that you can paint over it and when we remove the mist it later, those nice thin white lines will still be there. So you could use it for veining. If I'm doing a picture of a child with real flowing hair, I'll do some pieces of hair with it. Um, if I'm doing something that I want to keep really white, if I'm doing an animal portrait and I want to keep some tan fur really light because the rest of them is black, I'll use it for that. Um, but only if I need to. If it's a big enough area that I can just paint around it, then I'm not going to waste a bunch of mist at trying to keep it clean. So it depends on what you want to do with it. You can take it off just rubbing it with your finger, or you can use a pencil eraser. Hmm? Yes, you can paint over that. Yep. And most of the time I do, but you, um, it's real easy to come off. It will not come off your clothes, so don't get it on your clothes. And it will not come off a paintbrush. So you don't want to ever use a real good paintbrush to put that on. You want to use something disposable. Yes, yes. 
So if I wanted to paint this flower and then I wanted to paint it purple, but I wanted to keep pink stripes, you could put it on over your pink, paint it purple, and then when you take it off, you'll have your pink stripes. You can do multiples. So you can have white stripes, paint it pink, put more on, paint it purple, put more on, paint it blue, put more on. So you could actually have multiple stripes. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like the thickness of um it's not quite as thick as rubber cement. It's like um like a thick thickened milk. You know, it'll flow easily, but you just have to be careful with it. Okay. So now my nice my flower is nice and dry to the touch. As long as it's dry to the touch, I can do my shadowing. So now for my shadows, I want to make sure that I'm putting my shadows in the correct places. When you're doing a shadow, it's like anything else. You just don't want to put it anywhere. So you have to think about when we do shadows in school, what do we, where do we, what do we think about? Because what's going to make the shadow? We think about where the light's coming. Exactly. We think about the light source. So if the light source is coming from the right, the shadowing will be on the left. If the light source is coming from above and your shadowing is going to be below, it's just common sense. So my light source on this picture is kind of coming from the, the, the top right-ish. So my shadowing, which is gonna be done with some watered down black, that's going to come Underneath my little flip over here of my petal, my petal has kind of curled over. So I'm gonna put a little bit of a shadow there and then I'm gonna soften that with my wet brush. So I'm just gonna soften my edge. Okay, and you see you have that nice little shadow. What you're doing is you're gonna start to give your flower some dimension. It's not a flat pancake laying down flat. You have things going on there. You have curves and rolls and stuff. So I'm going to do that. I'm gonna put my shadow here. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna soften that a little bit. Now I'm not doing my big main shadowing yet because in order for me to do my big main shadows where part of my whole flower might be shadowed, I have to take my misfit off first because the little lines are also going to be shadowed. So I can't do all of my shadowing till I take that off, which will be very soon anyway. I'm gonna do a little bit of green in my center. And you can see you're painting right over your misket because that's going to keep it nice and white for you. So I'm painting right over my misket. And I'm also going to do something where I don't want solid paint. If I don't want solid paint, I'm doing something called dry brushing, where I'm going to lay my brush on its side. I'm going to put a little bit of paint on my brush but I'm gonna dab it off on a paper towel so that it's not sopping wet. And I'm gonna just drag it on my paper. And you see how you get that half painted, half not look? That's what dry brushing is. And that's really good for wood grain, flower petals, if you want like a real roughness to it, grass, hair, things like that. It's called dry brushing. And dry brushing, it's not hard, but you have to have just that right amount of paint on and you have to have the right amount of wet paint. A lot of people try to do it with drier paint and it's not going to move if the paint's too dry. So you have to have wet paint, but you just have to know how much to have on your brush. Okay. 
So now we have our center done. In order to do our real shadows now, we have to take off our misket. Because if you don't take the misket off, then after you're all done with your real shadowing, then you'd have to go back in and fine line all of those little white lines to shadow. And we certainly don't wanna do that. So you'll see, I can just rub it with my finger. You see it coming off? You see the white lines? That's what it does. It saves those white lines for you. We had a real, <clears throat> real thin brush. I use real thin. Yeah, I buy little um, eyebrow. eyebrow brushes. They're disposable. I think you get like a hundred for three bucks or something on, on Amazon. And they're wonderful. They're real skinny and then you can just throw them away. Yep. Now I'm sure that Glenn will not be using any eyebrow or eyelash brushes. So they would only be good for your painting. But you'll take this off. It's not necessary to take it off on the, um, the stamen part yet, because we're not gonna do that part yet, but I wanna get it all off on my actual flower. And if you don't wanna use your finger, you can use an eraser, a pencil eraser, but you just wanna be careful that you do it gently. You don't wanna be too rough with it. So now it makes it look like a really real flower. Isn't that cool? Okay. Now we're going to put on our real shadows. So if my light source is coming from my upper right area, then my shadowing is going to be from that fold over. So I want to make sure that I get that whole area shadowed in. Okay, so I'm going to pick a line where I think my shadow would be coming from. Use a bigger brush. And nobody ever wants to do shadows because they're watered down black. They think it's going to ruin your flower and it's not. Okay, so I'm going to just give it a little bit of interesting It's darker at first, isn't it? When mm -hmm. it dries, it's lighter. It'll be lighter. Yep. And then when you soften it, exactly. And I'm going to do my center separately just because I don't want to try to have to do everything all at one time. I'm going to take my time and I'm going to do my flower part first. And I'm going to leave, purposely leave some little spots unshadowed because that's going to cause interest in my petal. The T, there must be something on that petal above that's causing some sunlight to sneak through, maybe a hole in a petal. And it just makes it look a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to leave a couple things unshadowed but I'm gonna paint in most of the other. But you see these little holes here? I'm gonna do that only to cause, only to show some interest there. That really looks realistic. Doesn't it though? It looks like it's in, like, like it's kinda of under. Looks like it's in the vase in your house, huh? Yeah. <laughs> really like your mom's gonna have this flower. So here's my shadow. Now, of course, I'm gonna have the side of this petal shadowed a little bit, and I'm gonna have a couple little lines to show maybe some crinkles in that leaf. And I'm gonna put a little bit of a shadow down here. Because I wanna help to separate out these petals from the background too. Yeah, 
It looks so fun, yet it's hard to do. Like, <laughs> I think watercolor is hard, but, it, it, I, but it does look so cool. <laughs> so fun. It is a lot of fun yeah. to do, but it is a frustrating paint because you, everybody has the misconception that they cannot control watercolor. You can control watercolor. It will only go where you allow it to with water. So if you don't put water somewhere, it's not gonna go anywhere because it only flows where the water is or where your brush pushes it to. So you do have control, but because you have control, it's like anything else. Someone that has a whole lot of control can get out of hand. Power so power, great. that's right. Power is not always that great. So what you want to do is, you know, you have control, but you have to use it wisely. Okay. So when you are working on your flower, you have to think ahead of time. Where's my control going to be? Where do I want it to be? Do I really want it to be here? Or, or don't I? Do I need it to be over here? Or is that an area that I want? I don't want the, the shadowing to go. I don't want the pink to go. And you also don't have to do it all right this minute. If you wanna do half of your shadows today and half a month from now, as long as you don't create a hard line, you can do it anytime you want. And by not creating a hard line, you're just not overlapping your paint. So you would just take your shadow maybe up to a crease so that if you have that little overlap, it doesn't matter. It's a crease in your flower and it looks natural. If you don't want to take your salt off right away, you don't have to, but you have to take it off before you paint over it with something else. If you don't want to take your misket off tonight, you don't have to but you do have to take it off within about two weeks. So you have to plan for how you're gonna paint and, and what you're gonna get done and how far you're gonna go. And the key too is if you are sketching something, you absolutely have to be happy with your sketch before you start to paint. Cause the paint is not magical that it changes what you drew. It's not going to change anything. It's going to enhance what you drew. So if you don't like your drawing, you're not going to like your painting. Okay, that's just a very simple fact. Okay, so now we have the shadows in my flower. I'm pretty happy with those. I'm going to dry my center a little bit so that I can put my shadows in my center. And then I'm going to do a couple more of my leaves and at least put some of my really dark background in to really pop this flower out and then we'll move to that second flower, okay? Exactly, it'll follow the path of the water, mm -hmm. yep. My, I have um, two sisters and they were taking a class very, very long time ago, <laughs> about 30 years ago, maybe, well, actually about 34 years ago. And they wanted me to take this class with them. And at the time I was a director of marketing for Holiday Inns and I did, I did not have time. I mean, I worked 60 hours a week. I traveled. I, I mean, I was all over the place. Well, they just would not let up. They were relentless. And I was very artistic always. So I finally gave in. I said, all right, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. And I, I took a watercolor class and it was, I liked it, 
I didn't necessarily like the instruction that we had, but I did like the fact that it dried fast because a very long time ago, I painted a little bit with oil and that was <laughs> just like forever. It was, it was when you still use turpentine to clean up and, and it took forever to dry. So this was like right up my alley. It was dry before I got home, you know. So we did that class and it was a very unfortunate thing. The instructor passed away very suddenly. And the group wanted to stay together, but the only way that they could stay together was if they had an instructor at this place. And so my sister said, my sister could probably do it. <laughs> I said, I don't even like know that much about it. She said, well, you're artistic. I said, well, you know. <laughs> so that's how it all started. I mean, I just started and we kind of all taught each other, you know, for the first, you know, period of time. And your teaching career. <laughs> and then it all just kind of fell into place. And I did really enjoy it. Um, and then after I got married and, you know, had a baby and left the Holiday Inn and everything, then I, of course, I had a little bit more time. But I, um, I do really really enjoy it and I vowed that as a teacher both in school and teaching this I would not teach the way that I was instructed you can't just verbally say okay use your number two brush and put on red and you know well <laughs> that's not you put it on one way, you put it on another way, you put it on another way, which is okay if you know what you're even doing. Right. But if you don't even know what you're doing, so I said, I will do it with you so that you can actually see what we're doing. That doesn't mean I'm right. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that this is the way you have to do it, but you will have an idea of what you should be doing. If yours goes to the left and not the right, fine if it looks okay fine and if you like it better yet but at least you know what you're supposed to be doing and what direction you're supposed to be going with it and I do the same thing with the kids I'll at least show them if you want to do it a different way great if you want to do it at all that's even better but you have to have an end point to see what you're getting getting to or what you should strive to get to that doesn't necessarily mean that your end point has to be exactly the same but you know that there is an end point to it you know some of the stuff is pretty simple but some of the stuff is very difficult I mean I've read up on tons of things and when I first started teaching the watercolor I did a painting first at home so that when I actually went to teach it, I would know the right thing to say and do and show versus watching, you know, everybody make the same mistake I did. So, you know, it was a lot of trial and error too, but that's, that's life. You know, we're all gonna, you know, we all make mistakes along the way, but I will say that anything that I made a mistake on, that's what I've learned the most from because then you know not to do that again, or you know at least, well, I might make a mistake again, but I won't do that again. <laughs> so you know, you really learn from your mistakes. So now we're gonna go and we're gonna do another leaf. We're gonna do this middle first, put our little bit of shadowing in on our middle. And on my middle, again, I'm using that same light source. My light source doesn't change. So if my light source is coming this direction, that means this under here has to be shadowed. So I'm gonna put my shadowing here. I'm gonna kind of shape, shape my shadow, shape my stamen thing. I'll use that dry brushing again, just to get a little bit of roughness, but now I have a more realistic looking flower. Okay, now I'm going to go back and do a couple more leaves and stems. 
And then I'm gonna put in some nice black mixed with some indigo. Indigo is a real deep blue. And I'm gonna put that in, in the deepest parts behind my flower where no light is getting and where those parts are gonna pop my flower out. Because you need, especially if you have a really light flower like this, you need something dark behind it. You don't want something light and light and light and light, or it all kind of blends into one big thing. So you do want to have some nice dark things back in there. So let's get a couple more flower, or a couple more leaves painted real quick. Maybe throw a little bit more salt on, and then we'll get some darkness back in behind it. And then we can work quickly on that second flower and hopefully be pretty close to being finished with this flower. I use black for the shadow. I, I use, blue is good. well, I use black or I use black mixed with some indigo. Um, I'll use black mixed with purple. I'll use purple and indigo. Um, another misconception as far as I'm concerned is a lot of times they will say that true artists never use black and true artists never use white. Well, that could be, but my rule is if they make it, I use it. <laughs> <laughs> they make it, so I'm using it. You can mix black by, you know, mixing a lot of colors together, but I don't care how much you mix, you don't get true black. And the reason I want black is for a true black. Again, it's personal preference. I can't say, well, that artist is wrong because they said this. I will never say that because everybody should be able to paint, you know, however they want to. Personally, I like black. And the other thing I like is white. I feel that, you know, as a highlight, I need that white. I don't want to have to paint around that little white line every single time I put paint on. And I don't want to use misket because then it gives too hard of a defined shadow where if I want a soft shadow, I'm not going to be able to get that. I will get that with white. So I use white. Again, personal preference. There are a lot of artists out there that will never use white and never use black. And that's fine. That's your personal preference. But my personal preference is I will be using it. I think, especially if I'm painting glass, not on glass, but I'm painting something that is looks that I want to look like glass, to get that nice glassy sparkle, there's nothing better than white because you can put that on and you add that little touch of white to it and it makes the most perfect white spot that is a glare on that glass and I just don't think you can get it any other way. Now maybe I need to go back to a class and have them show me but um, I'm very happy with using my white. And I don't think Glenn has found too many faults yet with class. But when he does, I would bet that he will be the first to tell me that I should be doing it a different way. Right, Glenn? I would expect that of you. Okay, so I'm going to, again, put a little bit of that brown in along a tip of a leaf just to make it look like it might be turning brown. And I'm going to throw on a little bit of salt. Could you use something like rice too? You could. 
Sure, you could use anything like that that would be absorbent. You don't even have to use something that's absorbent. Anything that causes pressure onto that paint and moves that paint is going to cause an impression. We did a painting in my other tutorials. I do tutorials weekly for my painting, my watercolor class um, online. And last week we did, we used cellophane and we put the cellophane down for part of the floral background. And it created a bunch of leaf kind of things. And I'll show you that later, but um, it's, real, it's real interesting. So you can create, you know, texturing on your wet paint with anything. The key is putting it down and allowing it to dry before you lift it off. Because if you lift it off too soon, it will just go right back in. You know, your paint will go right back in. So we're gonna let this dry for a second and then I'm gonna put in some of my really nice dark blacks and show you what that's gonna look like, how realistic this is gonna look. And then we'll move on to that second flower, okay? Are there any questions so far? Nope, okay. You think I did good? Do I get an A? Yeah. Oh, good. I like A's. If you save your watercolor paints for the next day, I forgot about, I haven't watercolor painted in so long, but this gets me excited about it again. And um, if you have, like you're saying, you know, you want to do it maybe Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday mm -hmm. night. How, do you put like a wet paper towel in with your paints or anything? I never clean my palette. You never clean your palette? No. I didn't no. know that. Okay. No, because you're wasting the paint. You That's can always, true. as soon as water touches your dried paint, mm -hmm. it's wet again. You know, so yeah. it doesn't matter if it's dried on your palette, you just put a little bit of water to it and you have your color again. So if I mix my sap green and my cerulean blue and I got this beautiful yellow, or I mean, blue green color, well, you know, I want to use it again. So you just put a little water on it and you use it again. My, I, I, I shouldn't say I never clean my palette. I do, if like if I have black and set an indigo in that on my palette and then I'm using yellow tomorrow sure I'm going to wipe it off but I never clean out my bins or I mean anything like that there are a lot of people in my classes that clean their palettes totally white every time and I I yell at them every time too and say you're wasting paint you know it's not that you're using you're wasting so much but you're going to use this again you know that that pink will dry and I just have to put a little bit of water to it and it's viable again. Uh, the only thing is if you don't have a lid for your palette, it might be hard to you know, carry it around, but I have a lid for my palette and then my palette slides in the bottom of my bag. So, you know, but I never, I rarely clean my palette. It is important to change your water. You don't wanna work with dirty water because dirty water, even on a clean paper, is gonna show up as dirty water. Yeah. So you do wanna clean your, you know, keep your water clean. And don't leave your um, brushes in your water like this because that the glue that holds them in then loosens and your brushes will fall apart. What kind of soap do you use on your watercolor? None, just like water. Mm -hmm. I just read Mark's oils, so. That's for acrylic. Yeah, for yeah. Acrylic. yeah. No, never for water. No, yeah. No, no, just water, plain old water. Okay, so I'm gonna dry this again. I'm gonna put my blacks in and then we'll go and we'll move on to that second flower. And we're gonna get this thing looking perfect. And then it'll be the second painting I did today. I did one this morning too for my other class. I did a sunset this morning. I wish I was there. Beautiful skies. Oh my goodness. some gorgeous skies lately.
was in the house and I went outside and sit with the dog. And I looked up and said, Okay, so let's get this black in here now so that I can really make my flower pop out. Take that salt off. Oh yeah, salt is great. My local grocery store probably wonders why I buy so much salt. <laughs> Because it's just table salt. You don't have to buy any kind of special salting. You know, there is there is such a thing as artist salt. You don't need artist salt. You just it's regular old table salt. So now you can see, you can start to see how this really deep, dark black, once all of those leaves are painted in, that's going to help to pop out your nice light pink flower. Because what's going to be left now is just going to be different kinds of green leaves. Oh, yeah, now I can see it. You can see it much better now. Okay, over here, we're gonna have one more little bit of black and then we're gonna have another leaf over there. Let's get that one piece painted in. Sometimes it's the last few minutes of painting something in that really pops the whole picture out. So I always tell people if they say, oh, I just, I don't like it. You're not gonna like it until it is totally done because it's like anything else. It's like if you're making a dress and you put it on before you, before you sew the side seams and you hem it, of course you're not gonna like it it's not done yet you want to wait until it's all finished and then you'll see because sometimes it's just those last little um, shadows that last little white highlight that really just pops everything out okay. so now you can see how that flower is really going to come out. We're going to paint this second flower. And these will be leaves and it'll be all done. So I'm going to dry that real quick so I can put a wash on this second flower and get it started. And then you'll see it all pulled together.
Makes you want to go home and do it right now, huh? You're going to use paper. <laughs> so I'm going to wet this second petal or the second flower. I'm only going to wet towards the top of my, this is my outside um, petal. So I'm only going to wet towards the top of it so that I can keep that lighter. And down in the trumpety part, that's going to be darker. So I'm going to fill that in and bring that up to where my water would be. Second flower has no misket on it, does it? It does on the inside of it, but this is the outside, so it won't have any there. Okay, and then the inside, I'm gonna do the same thing. I have to dry this and I'm gonna do the, where it would touch here is gonna be darker and it'll be lighter along the edge. Okay, so I'll dry that. So I'm not doing wet against wet. I don't want that. Now I'm going to do the inside of the of the flower because this one is facing you. It's all open, okay? But this one is more closed, so we're having to go and paint down in there. So this is the deepest part of that wraparound piece. And as it comes closest to the top, then it's going to get watered down because towards the top is much lighter. So there we have that. This is what's going down in. This is already down in coming up. So this is the outside petal. This is the inside petal. So we'll do the same thing over here. Get nice and deep down here. There's multiple layers of petal on this one because it's not fully open yet. that little bit of uh, pink that led onto the leaf is, is okay. Huh? Oh yeah, just leave it go. We're getting there, Glenn. It's, it's cool, but uh, that's why I had a little 
shivering a little bit. Oh, oh, myself, I'm talking about myself. I don't even bring a jacket. I don't know why I didn't like it. I didn't sample it. Okay. 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 This is really fun to watch. It is. You have such control, but it, it looks like you're just kind of just. There's control. However, you have, you know how to control it. You know that where your water is, you're going to allow it to go. So you don't have to be so perfectly careful because you know where you're, where you're leading it. You know, it's like if you were leading someone, I mean, you could walk fast because you know where you're going, but you still, you still have to know the pathway to, to get them to where they want to go. So we'll dry this real quick. We're going to put in our last leaf or two. Last little bit of shadowing. But it's still, they have art in the lot, you know, throughout their whole lot. But it's kind of a nice escape. It's like yeah. if you like to, you know, go to the gym or do other things, and you have art. It's, um, it's but it also gives you a good thing to clean the window for anyone else in the room. That's just that's kind of been driven, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take my misket off of this one now because I have my pink on there. And I don't want to do my shadowing without it being off. So take that off. Now you can see those nice white veiny things. And now we're going to do the same thing with a shadow on this one. Okay, because we have to have shadows. Again, my light source is coming from the top. Okay, this leaf is going to ca cause a shadow on this flower. So again, that's one of your, that's one of the things you would have to be thinking about. Where would my shadow be? If I have a leaf overhanging my flower, it's going to cause a shadow. So you have to think about where that leaf would be and where that shadow would be. And then I have a little bit of a shadow on this overhang of my petal. It's curling over. So I'm going to put that shadow in. You see all these shadows in the photograph? Mm -hmm. Yep, you'll you see a, them. You took, mm -hmm. you took a picture? Uh-huh. Yep, you'll see them. This leaf is going to cause a shadow on this petal. So it's almost the whole petal that gets a shadow from that leaf. Maybe I'll leave a little, little bit just to make it look interesting. Okay, and then on the inside, now down in my center, there's gonna be a shadow down in here. 
because no light's getting down into like that trumpety part of the flower. So I'm gonna put a shadow down in there and then I'm gonna soften that shadow with water and just allow that shadow to come up a little bit. But it's gonna get softened with water so it's just gonna disappear. Isn't that cool? Is this a trump and vine? Is no, it's I, I, I'm, it's going to drive me crazy. No, it's, I'm going to call you. What is it? Hollyhock. No, you said hibiscus. That's a pretty thing. And I have a painting that I did years ago with acrylics. It was a hollyhock. Yep. And, and, I just saw that, you know, when you go through all the stuff. I just saw that recently. See? And I'm thinking that it was hibiscus. Hollyhock. Darn old Hollyhock. Oh, yeah. I remember picking them with bumblebees in them. Oh, oh. bumblebees in the flower. <laughs> I have, I, I have these growing with like in between my tomato plants. Yeah. And I didn't want to pull them out because they're so pretty, but yeah, they're, they're right in between my tomatoes. They come up every year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're seeds like crazy on them. Mm -hmm. Is that? The holly the holly oh yeah. Yep. Not for me. <laughs> but you don't see them like at the nursery or anything there. No. You never see holly Because I know when I was young, the, the playground yeah. where I grew right. up in Irwin, the whole hillside had holly yeah. hogs on it. Or a part of it, big part yeah, of it. Yeah, you don't see them in the They're pretty. Mm -hmm. Did your family plant those? I don't even know where the first one came from, but they come up every year now. And that's okay with me. They can just keep coming. So they have lots of seeds? They do. They do. Can you plant the seeds? Mm -hmm. Can you save the seeds? Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of your students? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we do. They're real pretty. Okay, we're going to hold you on that. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so there's my second flower. I'm going to let that one dry. I'm going to paint in my black here in my last couple leaves, and we'll be done. Now, on some of your leaves, since your flower is so detailed, on some of your bigger leaves that might be facing you, you might want to get a little bit of detail. And by that, I mean maybe just a little thick vein. That's and maybe a couple little side veins, but not on every leaf. You don't want to get carried away. You don't have to get that involved, but you can do it on a few. You don't want to take your attention away from your pretty flowers by making your leaves so intricate that then that becomes the interest point. You don't want to do that. You want to have your interest stay on your hollyhocks. Now I'll be saying hollyhocks all night long. <laughs> hollyhocks. Oh, yeah. These old hollyhocks, yeah. Tomorrow I won't be able to remember. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be calling me. Well, they are pretty. And they get really tall. I mean, the ones that I have in my yard, they get about seven feet tall. Yeah, and the flowers are probably about six inches in diameter. They're not little. They do. Either that or they like my tomato plants. They might. Got some. I, last year I had a lot of nice tomatoes, so I'm hoping for... A lot of nice tomatoes this year too, because I like to can them. Marcy and I are probably the only two people in the area. I think so. Uh, our community yeah. garden, anything that they have left over, they call me all the time and say, you know, we have about 
you know, big bag of tomatoes left this week. Do you want them? Yep. Uh, so I take them. Of course, I give them a donation for them, but then I can them. And last year I had like 40 quarts of tomatoes, but I'm, I have about three left. Best. Yep. The best. the best for sauce. Oh. No, you're not. <laughs> You can do, Marcy and I both have different but quick ways to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's nice because you can only eat so many tomatoes when you're. Yeah. But boy, it's oh, the best sauce and salsa. Mm. Yeah. Chili. Chili. Yeah. I make creamy, creamy tortellini, tomato yep. tortellini oh, soup. That's good. Stuffed pepper soup. Yeah. Oh boy. But you know, the. What also is it again so interesting? I belong to a garden club as well, but also they have so many beautiful flowers, so many different mm -hmm. kinds of flowers. Um, well, green plants. I mean, I guess it's just the whole, all the living stuff is pretty fascinating. It's amazing. But so many different versions of flowers alone. People don't realize. How you know how much is out there? You know, both in with everything. You know, with your flowers or whatever. Okay, one more black spot, one more leaf. It's done. What do you think, Glenn? Really looking good. Really looking good? Yeah. Okay. You're the boss. You're the boss tonight. This is going to pop this flower out really good. There I am. There I am. Can't be off camera here. So what do you think, Glenn? What are we doing this summer? Anything good? We're going up to the grocery store and see now. That's I good. Stay, I stay at my uh, grandma's for about three or four days. Cool. My uncle and Glenn are also there, but it's interesting. I'm sure it is. Anytime you're with grandma and grandpa, it's fun. But my grandpa doesn't live there anymore. He died, but Aww. You know. but Graham's still there, right? Yeah, yeah. In the third week of July, we might be well at a local camp, so I'm gonna be exhausted that evening. So I don't know that we would be able to come in July, but maybe in August. Sure. Well, in the one in July, it'll be on film. Oh, I mean, true. it's videoed, so you can watch it anytime. Okay. Yep, you don't have to be here in person. Because I haven't been out of state before. Uh oh. Like I recently was recently it's been my first time on a boat. So cool. <laughs> That's great. Oh, I think it's still oh it's still good. Yep. Uh huh. You have to.
Okay, I'm gonna do our last leaf. And then I think we're gonna be done. Then we'll go over and see what we missed if anything. Okay, get these last couple leaves done. Maybe we'll make them a little darker. We'll put in some indigo. In here. <laughs> okay, we are done. What do you think? Yeah. So cool. Okay. Nicole? Not too bad for an hour and a half, huh? Okay, there we go. So, again, you can go back to it tomorrow. You can go back to it in three weeks. As long as you would have taken your misket off, make sure you get your misket off. Take your salting off. You can go back. Resalting, you probably can't do because once your um, salt has had a reaction with the paint, it's probably not going to have that same reaction. So if you would put more salt on, it probably would not. If you would go to a different area that has not been salted, but has been painted, and you put on a wash of paint and salt, you will get a reaction. You just won't get a reaction where you've already salted because the, you know, the chemicals already down there. So it's not going to, you know, do it again. But um, doesn't have to be detailed. That's just my personal way of doing things. If you wanted it to be, you know, no boundary kind of thing, you can just let your paint go. You're giving it the path with the water, but it's basically however you'd want to do it. Okay. Really cool. Thank you. Thank you. So now what are you going to do? The first thing you get up in the morning, go, go get those paints. Go get all this. Go get those paints. <laughs> I will tell you, I mean, I'll tell everybody, even the people at home, you don't have to buy the best watercolor paint. I prefer tubed paint because um, it, to me, it lasts a lot longer. Um, the cake paint, it seems like you have to put water on it forever before you even get enough to do anything with it. So your tubed paint won't do that. Your tubed paint, you got, you know, you get a really quick reaction with that. Paint brushes, you don't have to have the best watercolor brushes. Don't go buy squirrel pair, you know, hundred dollar <laughs> brushes. You don't need that. Mine are all, um, you know, basically standard $5, $10 brushes. You don't have to go buy super expensive brushes. What you do need, good paper. If you don't have good watercolor paper, you're gonna get puddling. And then once you get puddling, then you can't layer because you still have a puddle of water. And then once that puddle of water starts to dry, it dries a little bit and then it's still wet and it dries a little bit and then it's still wet. And then you get rings. You won't have that with good paper. So, I mean, I'm not saying that arches is the best. I like arches, that's my personal preference. There's Fabriano, there's arches, there's all kind of watercolor paper. I prefer the sheet paper versus a block because the sheet paper is more, I think is more absorbent. The block is pressed so firm, it kind of takes the absorbency you know, out. But some people love a block, it's up to you. I prefer a sheet 
sheet paper, this is a quarter of a sheet. So there's four of these on a big sheet. And a big sheet is about seven or eight dollars, but you get four paintings of it. Um, it's again, it's personal preference, what you like. I like the sheet paper. 140 pound cold press. There's 300 pound. I think that's like a, a tough cardboard. Some people really like it, but I mean, this is fine for Doesn't what I do. Kind of a that's a block. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, it's up to you, whatever you, whatever you like. I like the sheet paper. I don't like to tape my paper down either because I move my paper too much. Some people like to tape it on a big board. Um, and again, that's just personal preference, but I move my paper way too much to be on a big board. You know. And if you're gonna frame it, then that'll sort of flatten it for you. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. And some, you know, super professional artists out there might hold their head and cry, <laughs> but I take my painting, I turn it on the back, I lay it on my ironing board, I put a cotton cloth over it and I steam it and it's perfectly flat and, and there's no issues at all. <laughs> so you can do that, but don't tell anybody because you know, I might get thrown out of the, you know. <laughs> but it works for me and it's perfectly flat and, and then you can frame it. So what do you uh, do with all your paintings? Do you sell them? You I sell them a lot. But um, I also have big piles of home. Yeah. The watercolor is better than if you had stacks. Oh, sure, colors, so sure. Little... And a quarter sheet watercolor paper will frame up in a standard 16 by 20 frame with a 16 by 20 mat. Okay. You don't have to buy anything special. That's another reason why I like the quarter sheets because it's just very standard. So you can get the paper at like a Walmart? You can get it there, you can get it at Michael's. Um, my, there is an artist and craftsman supply um, store in Squirrel Hill. It's on Hobart Street. That's what it's called, artist and craftsman supply. And they have anything you can imagine. And if you tell them that you're my student, they'll give you 10% off of anything you buy. Yeah. So 10% is 10%, right? Yeah, it's great. So anything else? I'm gonna show you what I painted today. Let's see. Yep, you'll have to. So this is what we painted on my tutorial for today. Oh, wow. Uh, that's that's really good. Good. You wanna let the dog too. Jesus, that's great. Yep. So wow. easy. Easy, easy. That's very nice. So anyway, um, there are a couple um, videos on the Monroeville site, the ones that we did before. You can always go back to those. There's fruit, there's water, there's glass, there's a bunch of them. And then we'll have one next month. It will be videoed also. And there are all kind of things with Monroeville library in the Monroeville Arts Council, not just watercolor. So you can do all kinds of things. There's art in the park. You would love art in the park. 